Hey, so as always, here is the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. I think it should be a shorter video. The goal of this video is to talk about modular arithmetic in general, but from the point of groups, not necessarily like doing fractional modularity, which is something that if you want me to talk about it, you can leave a comment down below. It's pretty fascinating stuff. It's pretty cool. But today I just want to talk about groups and how you can go from modular arithmetic to a general framework for modular arithmetic using groups. Okay, so probably the easiest place to work with modular arithmetic and the most intuitive place that you can work with it is in the integers. So if we go ahead and pick some positive integer for any other integer that we want to choose, we can actually write that integer as a product of some other integer with the integer that we chose first, plus a remainder term. And the remainder term is going to be between zero and k minus one, where k is the number that we initially chose. And so this equality is essentially what division is. If you haven't seen this before, it's very common to represent division this way in number theory and in other areas of math where we don't want to talk about fractional division because it makes some things a little bit hairier to deal with. So just to get used to this version of division, we can go ahead and look at an example of division like 97 divided by 4, which is 24 and 1 fourth. And we can rewrite that in terms of this other way of representing division, where 97 would then be equal to 24 times 4 plus 1. And just to label everything so that all of your division things are present in this equality, we have all of that there as well. And so modular arithmetic is really focused on the remainders in the division process. So if we were to say, go ahead and mod by four or mod by the integer that we originally chose, then we would get this thing is equal to one mod four. And some other examples of this are, if you take any integer and divide it by four, if those, uh, okay. And some other examples of this can be generated by taking two numbers, divide them by four, and make sure that they have the same remainder. So for instance, you could take seven and three are equivalent modulo four, and 13 and one. And so one of the questions that you might have is that, well, you said at the beginning that you would be talking about abstract algebra in some sense, or groups in some sense, and how that works with modular arithmetic. So what's the key thing here that works with modular arithmetic from an abstract algebra point of view. And the broad answer is subgroups, sort of. So just to start out, we're gonna go ahead and work with subgroups. So a subgroup is a subset of a group that is a group under the same binary operation. The less the notation does hurt my soul a little bit, but that aside, we can go ahead and look at an example. So if we go ahead and take the group of the integers under addition, we can actually take a fairly simple subgroup of h equal to four times the integers, which in set form is equal to zero plus or minus four plus or minus eight, dot, 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 plus or minus four times n, dot, 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 dot. And so I've gone ahead and just written a very like bare bones argument of why h is a subgroup over here. You can take a look at that if you want to, but the important thing that I want to think about here is that I want to go ahead and compare equivalence modulo 4 to the group 4z, or 4 times the integers. So if we go ahead and look at equivalence classes or sets of numbers that are declared equal by the equivalence relation equivalent modulo 4, we can go ahead and look at, well, what are the numbers a that are equal mod 4 to 0? And turns out that those numbers are just the positive and negative multiples of 4 along with 0. And those are exactly the things in our subgroup h. Next, if we look at the things that are equivalent to 1 mod 4, we're going to get everything that was in our subgroup, but just plus 1. And a similar thing can be said for numbers that are equivalent to 2 mod 4 and to 3 mod 4. And just to make sure that we got everything when we we're looking at equivalence classes here, we can go ahead and take the union of h with 
everything in H plus 1 unioned with everything in H plus 2 unioned with everything in H plus 3, and we end up getting all of the integers again. And so somehow, which I haven't really clarified how at this point, our choice of subgroup and the alterations of which these H plus B sets are deeply connected to the arithmetic that we were doing on the integers modulo 4. So to sort of dive into that a little bit, we can go ahead and start talking about what cosets are. So given a group H, which is a subgroup of G, the left cosets of H and G, which I'm going to write as G colon under L H, which is sort of a messy way of writing it, but for me it just makes it really clear what I'm talking about, is equal to the set of everything in H left multiplied by things in G. Alternatively, you could also talk about right cosets, and it's going to be helpful to do so as we continue on here. So a right coset can be defined by everything in H right multiplied by things that are in G. Also, if your group is working with an addition operation instead of a multiplication operation, you can also express these ideas additively by adding things on the left to our subgroup H and adding things on the right to our subgroup H. So the first thing to note here with how we've decided to define cosets is that there is a lot of opportunity to duplicate a coset that might already be accounted for in our set. And so it's important to think about when certain cosets are equal. And so we're going to work with just the left cosets or the right cosets, because if you start to intermingle them, you're going to start thinking about commutativity and what types of commutativity are present with this set of cosets or not, and we don't want to do that right now. So the question then is, when are two left cosets equal and when are two right cosets equal? The equality of left cosets is going to give us a way of defining what it means to be left equivalent modulo our subgroup H on our group G. And in a similar way, when we go ahead and look at what right cosets are equal, we're going to have a way of denoting what it means to be right equivalent modulo H in our group G. And so that's great and all because we've gone ahead and we've been able to define a type of modularity on some abstract algebraic object. So in theory, you should be able to do some algebra on this modular thing, but there's a catch because arithmetic might not exist when you go ahead and modulate by some subgroup. You have to be careful. One way you can see why you have to be careful is if we go ahead and look at a particularly small group where things break down. So if we go ahead and look at the symmetries of the square, which is a group of order eight containing a rotation by 90 degrees, a rotation by 180 degrees, a rotation by 270 degrees, a rotation by 360 degrees, which is equal to the identity. All of those rotations are counterclockwise, by the way along with a horizontal flip, a vertical flip, a bottom left to top right corner flip, and a top left to bottom right corner flip. So if we look at this group and we go ahead and define a subgroup K, which is equal to our identity element and the top left to bottom right hand corner flip, we're gonna see that arithmetic after we mod out by K is not going to make a ton of sense. So to see this, we're going to go ahead and take a left coset and a right coset, both of which are generated by doing the left and right multiplication by the horizontal flip. Um, mind you, I say multiplication, but the operation here is function composition, um, but it's going to be written like multiplication, so that's how I'm going to talk about it. Write out the left and right cosets, kh and hk, really quickly. But we also can draw this graph, which is a little bit more descriptive about what's going on. And the interesting thing about this is that when you go ahead and do the top left to bottom right hand corner flip, and then the horizontal flip, and then you do it in the inverse where you do the horizontal flip first, and then you do the top left hand corner to bottom right hand corner flip, you're going to get two different resultant rotations. One of them is going to be a rotation by 90 degrees, and the other one is going to be a rotation by 270 degrees. And this is like the first evidential thing that says like, oh, this th thing might break from an arithmetic point of view. So with arithmetic, when you have two equal elements, you should be able to go ahead and 
take some element and apply an operation with one of the equal elements and that should be equal to applying the operation with the other thing that it was equal to because you're able to take two equal things and apply them to the same thing and get the same result. We're gonna show that that's not the case for this particular subgroup of the symmetries of the square. So to do this, we're gonna go ahead and start with the rotation by 270 degrees. We know that that was generated by first doing a horizontal flip and then doing the top left-hand corner to bottom right-hand corner flip. But according to what it means to be right equivalent mod K, that top left-hand corner to bottom right-hand corner flip is going to be right equivalent modulo our subgroup K to the identity element. So we end up getting the rotation by 360 degrees times the horizontal flip, which is then equal to just the horizontal flip by itself. And then we can go ahead and expand that out again and say that, well, it was the identity, so we could have just done the horizontal flip times the identity instead. Which then, because the identity is right equivalent modulo our subgroup K to the top left-hand corner to bottom right-hand corner flip. That means that that whole thing is equal to the horizontal flip times that top left-hand corner to bottom right-hand corner flip. And that is shown in the diagram to be a rotation by 90 degrees. And so if we go ahead and transition back to our context of our subgroup K, where we have this string of equalities that says that rotation by 270 degrees is right equivalent modulo k to rotation by 90 degrees, and we apply the definition of right equivalence modulo k, we get a rotation by 270 degrees times the inverse of a rotation by 90 degrees, which is just two 270 degree rotations, which is equal to a rotation by 180 degrees, which is not actually in our original subgroup K. And so arithmetic breaks down. And so the thing that's actually missing here is that there needs to be a little bit more structure on the equivalence relation that we're using. In particular, the equivalence relation that we're using needs to be what is called a congruence relation. So an equivalence relation is a congruence relation if, say, you have A equal to B and C equal to D, then you're going to have A times C is equal to B times D. It's the same as that property that I mentioned sort of ambiguously earlier on about how you need to be able to take things that are equal to each other and apply them to the same thing and get the same result. This is just a more formal way of writing that out. And so this is the thing that modulo four arithmetic has that our subgroup of the symmetries of the square did not have. So in order to avoid this issue that we had with our particular subgroup on the symmetries of the square, we can go ahead and add an additional condition, which says that the left cosets are equal to the right cosets. So G times our subgroup is going to be equal to our subgroup times G. And so then with that added condition, we can go ahead and return to the symmetries of the square and pick a new subgroup, namely the rotations of the square. And when we take that subgroup, we end up getting only one other coset, which is just the reflections of the square. And so the cool thing here is that you're actually able to do arithmetic on the symmetries of the square mod the rotations. Um, so you're doing a very general or a very abstract version of modular arithmetic that's not on the integers and you're actually using a abstract structure to do that math, which is pretty cool. You can do this with a ton of other groups as well and their subgroups and this additional condition that we put on our groups, the whole G times the elements of the subgroup is equal to the elements of the subgroup times G thing is one of many equivalent conditions for what is called a normal subgroup. But yeah, essentially that's all I wanted to get through today. It takes a idea that's commonly used in like introductory programming about doing modular things with integers and generalizes that up to other more abstract things that are more geometric in flavor or have a group structure in themselves, um, which I think is pretty cool. 
that aside, uh, this is where I'm ending this video. So if you did enjoy it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics content. As always, I'm Nathan, this was Chalk, and I will see you next time.